Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Noel Healy, and I'm a professor in the Geography and Sustainability Department here at Salem State. I've organized this talk today as part of Salem State's Earth Day celebrations. Um, Salem State began celebrating Earth Days in 2000, um, and these events bring renowned researchers, activists, and officials to campus to engage students, faculty, staff, alumni, and the larger community. Today, I'm delighted to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Abby Devin Eigham. Abby is a medical doctor, ac academic, and campaigner specializing in public health, environmental inequalities, and racial justice. She is an NIHR academic clinical fellow in public health in the Faculty of Health and Medicine at Lancaster University and a clinical research fellow in the Institute for Global Health at University College London. Abby writes and advocates on the extractive ind industries that fuel climate breakdown and the public health impacts of policing and community-led solutions. Her work has been featured in Forbes, BBC, The Lancet, and the British Medical Journal. So without further ado, I'd like to hand proceedings over to Abby, who will speak for around 30 minutes or so. This will be followed by Q&A. And if you've got any questions, please pop them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Over to you, Abby. Thank you so much, Noel, and uh, thank you to everyone for joining. Um, I will start by sharing my slides, if that's okay. So I hope this works. Please say if it if it's not working, I assume it is. Um, great. So I'm here to talk about climate change, health and racial justice in about 30, 35 minutes. Um, three important aspects um, that affect life um, all over the world. And what I'm going to say is by no means groundbreaking. I'm building on work that has already been done um, in research and grassroots movement spaces. But I would like to start by honoring those that came before me and acknowledge how deep history and how wide history is. And I'd like to honor my ancestors that have protected and defended land, which is now extracted to generate capital for the ruling class and the imperial core. So I am Sri Lankan and um, my family come from the deep south of India, um, from a place called Tirnalveli, which translates to rice paddy, um, well actually sacred rice paddy, um, and the community there are predominantly farming communities. So as much as I honour my ancestors, I also would like to take a moment to acknowledge that there will be a lot more to come after me. Um, who will be doing and continuing to do this work on justice and liberation. So climate justice. Climate justice is not simply about lowering emissions. It involves human rights in solidarity with people and communities that are most affected. And it involves promoting ecological unity of all species. And Climate justice, which is what we will focus on in this, um, in this next 30 minutes, is climate justice has to grapple with notions of debt and coloniality that have been caused by centuries of ongoing oppression that are felt deeply by generations of minoritized people. And justice, climate justice, is about building a world that is fundamentally different to what we have right now. And it involves acknowledging multiple different knowledges, including indigenous life ways as well. A bit about what my group does. So I'm part of a group called Race and Health. And our starting point for climate change and health justice is that racial justice is at the center of what we do. And we, what, who are we? Race and Health, we are a collective of mostly academics and activists who also work in grassroots movement spaces, and we're a hub for investigating how racism and discrimination affects health and what interventions can be used to improve health in the context that we live in. I'd like to start with a documentary video that um, our collaborative called the Envisioning Environmental Equity Collaborative um, created. So this is created by 
young people from Uganda, the Philippines, and the Quilombola community in Brazil. Um, and this essentially summarizes how health, racial justice, and climate change all interact. It's about three minutes long, I think. I hope this is working. Está muito quente agora. A canotinha mata aí era rico, bem, bem refrigerado, né? Por isso que eu planto muita planta assim. É por isso, para a casa do, do calor, né? Mesmo assim dá muito calor. Parang hindi ko maiimagine yung, yung panahon ng clima ngayon. Parang sabi ko, Está havendo muito assim, é, febre, é, pessoas que criam seus bebezinhos sofrem com o negócio de falta de ar, é diarreia, muitas das vezes vômito. Na comunidade, a questão da saúde na comunidade ela é um pouco precária. Primeiro começa porque nós não temos uma, um posto de saúde, que é o básico. Nós não temos um medicamento básico. Nós temos um ACS na comunidade, que faz o mínimo do, da tarefa de um ACS. E o atendimento em si da saúde, quando alguém adoece, somos nós por nós. binibigay sa amin kung ano yung mga dapat na dito sa samahan naman namin eh. Nagbibigayan. Wala siyang tulak kabigit. Nagagal. Campaign na lang namin is linisin yung mga kanal. Kailangan ito yung linisin natin para maibsan yung pagkakaroon ng Uh, maraming lamok at pagkaroon ng maraming uh, dengue at mga leptospirosis. Okay, so what will we be discussing today? How do climate change, health, and racism and structural discrimination interact? We'll talk about reparative justice and ecological healing and what an anti-colonial, what anti-colonial solutions look like. And finally, we'll also touch on this concept of tunnel vision. And what I mean by tunnel vision is being so narrow in your field of vision that sustainability equates carbon emissions only and not the rest of the intricate web of life and interdependence that we live in to create sustainability that is way more expansive than just reducing emissions and how we can break free from that field of vision. We'll start with health. What is health? 
So WHO defines health as a complete state of physical and mental well-being, not only the absence of disease. But even this definition isn't ambitious enough and completely ignores healing, which is a process. And in the extractive economy, health becomes just fixing the disease as opposed to genuine well-being and liberation. And the WHO definition also fails to show us that health is deeply rooted in connection with our fellow humans, with land, with non-human beings, and even with ourselves. And when, when I say self, it's self with a capital S. So our spiritual health as our indigenous leaders have taught us. And not only is health relational, Health is also ecological. The environment determines how healthy we are. The health, uh, the environment nourishes us, but also when the environment is sick, so are we. When we breathe in pollutants, it affects our mind, it affects our body. But when we breathe clean air, we feel nourished. I said to you that health is relational. By this, I mean, if I ask a question, can you really be healthy when your community around you are unhealthy? And community health and healing has been stolen from us by the ruling class. And the current world order has tricked us into believing that health is disconnected from one another, so humans and other human beings, as well as health being disconnected from earth itself. In Adler Bolton's and Vierkant's book, Health Communism, they argue that health has been stolen from minoritized people and used to propagate extractive forces. Who are minoritized people? So the definition of minoritized is the extractive, ero the, the active erosion of people's identities by power structures. And by minoritized, I normally and refer to people who might be minoritized due to a form of structural discrimination. So that could be patriarchy, ableism, um, class divide, or racism. And certain people's health is desirable either for labor or for preservation, while others' health is deemed disposable. And therefore, in our current economic system, the worst outcomes are felt in minoritized people all around the world, no matter where you are in what community. So for example, life expectancy in the Niger Delta in Nigeria, which is home to projects such as the oil giant Shell, is reported to be 10 years less than the rest of Nigeria. And this kind of fossil fuel racism and extraction causes death and sickness globally from undrinkable water in Chevron, uh, due to Chevron's pollution in the Amazon to the racialized impact of fracking in the USA. Land defenders are murdered and criminalized and thousands of people are killed in wars to facilitate oil access for multinational companies, which is driven by militarism. So as you can see, health justice can only be achieved if we challenge the extractive economy that health is currently in. But more importantly, what's healing? As I said before, healing's a process. And as a colleague and incredible neuroscience researcher and indigenous um, uh, person who is a doctor in the UK, she, she says, Araceli Carmago says, healing replenishes, nourishes, and repairs our entire beingness. Healing is an individual as well as a collective process. So as you can see, refocusing on an expanded view of health and realizing that illness is a product of systems that create sickness, then we can allow health systems to be tools of justice and liberation. Now we'll go on to climate change. So what we call climate change, I, I, I know many of you are studying environment and, um, and geography, but something that I really want to stress is climate change as we know it is a result of exploitation of ecosystems and industrial contamination in the name of capital and profit. And we know 
that the generation of capital requires land and it requires us to extract from this land. And not only that, it requires people to be separated from the land and people, so different groups of people to separate, to be separated from one another. And so climate crisis or climate change must be understood as the consequence of these separations. And the separations are nothing but colonial capitalism. So capitalism is the economic system that separates and it does that through exploitation of people and nature to generate profit and wealth accumulation for the elites. Meanwhile, waste is dumped from extractive industries onto poor and minoritized communities causing health injustice. And the separation that comes in colonialism is that it's a system in which one country forcibly occupies another, exploits, separates people, has hierarchies put in place, and then the occupied country is exploited for economic gain. Climate change, if we describe it like this, is not an equalizer, as people often call it in the mainstream. It's actually a great multiplier. It's not only a symptom of our current world order, but it also acts as salt that we pour on our existing wounds. And these existing wounds are nothing but our chronic problems in society like poverty, hunger, disease, pollution, conflict. One more definition and then we'll move on. So when a capitalist society was created, there were winners and losers because it pursued a racial hierarchy. And African labor, we know, enabled the massive expansion of economic production and accumulation of wealth from goods. And African people's bodies and health were seen as the most valuable commodity in the American colonies. So this is health coming in back into race, racism and capitalism. And this wealth is what gave rise to the industrialization in the global north with the most recent invention being the fossil fuel industrial complex. I'm sure some of you may know this, but if you didn't, Shell was a colonial project. In 1956, prior to Nigeria's independence, Shell convinced the Nigerian government to create a joint venture in the name of labor and economic gain. And then Shell began exploring for oil in the Niger Delta. This is where life expectancy is less than the rest of the country. And similarly in India, it, India was made dependent on coal during colonialism, and now it is scapegoated at international conferences for not letting go of coal. The colonial era has been followed by neo-colonialism, whereby people in low and middle income countries continue to be exploited by macroeconomic forces. And fossil fuel companies are nothing but neo-colonial industries because they have headquarters in the global north when extraction predominantly takes place in the global south or in poorer minoritized communities within the global north. And the extremely shocking thing is that governments across the world have collectively handed over $400 billion in, term, in, in subsidy form per year to the fossil fuel industry, which some and some countries are giving more in subsidies than their health budget. So I'll say that again. Some countries are giving fossil fuel industries more money in the form of subsidies than putting into their health budget. And colonial, colonialism and neocolonialism, having caused the decimation of land and resources, leaves these regions more vulnerable to and less able to adapt to what we then see as the health impacts of climate change, which is the, the very surface level of what is going on. So now if we actually understand that climate change starts with colonial capitalism, with extractivism and racism as tools for separation and violence, then we can start to realize that a fight for climate change and health justice is also a fight against racial capitalism as well. A little about unequal responsibility. Now, rich countries have drained $152 trillion from the global South since 1960. 
This is neocolonialism. And countries, as Michael Parenti says, countries are not underdeveloped, they're overexploited. And these, I mean, you can see Noel Healy's um, paper here with a great diagram about inequality and responsibility for climate change. Um, and then on the right hand side, you can see um, Jason Hickel's paper, which shows that the global north, which represents 14% of the world's population, is responsible for 92% of historical emissions in excess of the safe planetary boundary. And I'm sure as geographers, you know what that means. It's the ecological ceiling, sort of like your overdraft in your bank account. And in terms of industry, we know that 100 companies account for 70% of all emissions and the richest 1% of people globally are responsible for more than more emissions than 50%, the bottom 50%. Now let's look at how racism and health interact before we put racism, health and climate change all together. Modern health systems were founded as part of colonialism and remain under the capture of capitalism. And as Syrian physician and humanitarian doctor Tamam Aludat says, medicine is a tool of the empire. Medicine and science served colonialism primarily by codifying race and deeming certain bodies being more desirable for labor or more, dispos or more disposable. And from anything from deeming Muslim Algerian men to having exotic syphilis due to having a starved brain, to exploiting slave women's bodies to experiment on them to breed more slaves, Medicine has a long and dark history with racism and eugenics during colonialism, which was normalized by white Europeans. And today, these systems remain in our health systems. These structures remain in our health systems, and our health systems therefore remain hostile and cause harm. So, for example, um, in the National Health Service in the UK, Health workers are told to question people's migratory status upfront, and migrants who are not eligible for care can be charged or denied care. And this is where doctors become border controllers and gatekeepers. Another example of racial capitalism in health is the failure to fairly distribute COVID-19 vaccinations and under, essentially us having vaccine apartheid during the pandemic. As me and my colleague Rhiannon Osborne argue in our paper um, on tunnel vision, we say, what is the point of a greener health system that continues to allow this injustice to occur? And so, as I said before, the disproportionate health impact of climate change on communities that, as we've seen, are least responsible for the climate emergency forms the most peripheral layer in this long history of colonial violence. And this conceptual model um, from our paper in The Lancet from December 2022, it shows us the layers through which racism operates to cause health inequalities. So we can see the red structural discrimination due to separation and hierarchical power lies at the core. And on the surface, what we see is differential health outcomes. And please do have a read of our Lancet paper. We also have an infographic that's very accessible um, for people. So what are the health impacts of climate change? They are so vast from heat related mortality and illness to food insecurity, the rise in vector borne disease such as malaria due to temperature changes, air pollution from burning fossil fuels, the mental health impact that people face, especially young people, as well as the impact and trauma on our, our bodies and minds from migration related to climate change. What happens when climate change and racism and health interact? Racism kills, and we know that climate change also kills. Together, they interact and multiply and devastate the lives of minoritized people across any society leading to premature death, as abolitionist scholar Ruth Wilson Gilmore says, premature death between, so showing inequalities in premature death between the global north and the global south, as well as minoritized people within countries. 
I'll give you a couple of examples of how this interacts um, with some statistics as well. So following Hurricane Harvey, um, Black Texan residents had a fourfold higher risk of PTSD than white residents. We know also that racially minoritized people face a disproportionate burden of occupational health risks, such as heat related illnesses, because of the way that our workplaces are structured and the nature of jobs that people who are racialized tend to take. And within USA cities, areas with greater proportions of people of color, black and people of color residents are hotter on average than areas with more white residents. And this is because of a variety of issues, but due to redlining, less tree cover, and also poor access to green space and active travel, which excludes communities of color as well. And in the UK, we see a similar pattern. Air pollution is statistically higher in neighborhoods that are more deprived and have more than 20% of people who are not white. Other examples of this interaction. So previously colonized countries have less economic resource to adapt their health systems and be ready to respond to climate change, which then contributes to a disproportionate burden of deaths in the global south. In terms of migration, how does it interact? So without the legal recognition or protection, climate refugees are excluded from accessing health systems in receiving countries. And what about indigenous people in settler colonies? So that we know that the life expectancy gap between an indigenous people and white people in settler colonies like the US, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, this life expectancy gap will worsen with climate change. I'd like to give you a bit of a snapshot of some of the research that we've been doing in, in the race and health group. The area of climate change and health is a fast developing research field. There's current evidence that mostly focuses on keeping track of what the health impacts of climate change are globally. I'd invite you to have a look at the Lancet countdown on climate change and health, which is essentially a tracker. Um, it tells you, it's a global tracker of um, how um, health is affected by climate change. Um, and it only gives data at the national level, which brings me on to some of the gaps. Um, we also have data on mitigation and adaptation, so what interventions can we do to stop climate change and respond to the things that we're already facing related to climate change. And there's also some work being done on low emission healthcare systems, so how can we recycle materials in healthcare better, how can we prescribe medications that, are, that have a low, lower carbon footprint, so that work is there. But what's not there is data on health outcomes for people who are minoritized. And by minoritized, I said before, it's people who are disabled, people who are minoritized due to gender, people who are undergoing some kind of structural discrimination. Um, there's very little data on that on a global level. So we need more data granularity, but also the data is overwhelmingly quantitative and quantitative data is generally um, more highly regarded because of positivism and the fact that we, the way that we view reality is incredibly objective or objectivism is, is what is prioritized in the world of health research at least, but I know I'm sure it will be the case in other disciplines as well. So it's so important to also highlight qualitative approaches and, and use things like testimonies and case studies and do this by centering the voices and lived expertise of people who are most affected and especially young people as well. And this is what we do in our research. So we had three objectives which are related to the gaps in research. What we did to analyze patterns of health inequalities and responsibility is that we did a mapping exercise. So we did a geographic analysis of responsibility for climate change and projected mortality. And what these maps do is help us visualize the distribution of inequality, which will then hopefully help us guide policy actions that address things like loss and damage and reparations and establish which communities, at least at the global level, are owed reparations for harm that they have felt for generations. 
that's number one. Number two is documenting how the interaction happens. So what we did was scope the literature do it through a scoping review, and we've summarized how um, climate change, health, and structural discrimination interact. Um, and that's through a scoping review. And then the third um, objective was to actually demonstrate how this is happening. So what are the pathways through which different forms of structural discrimination interact with climate change and health in the most affected areas. So there is a lot of data, well, I shouldn't say a lot of data, there is more data skewed in the global north. And by the global north, I mean specifically in the US and Canada and New Zealand. There's very little in the global south looking at minoritized communities in the global south. So that's what we did through case studies, testimony and policy analysis in a few different countries. And I just want to briefly show you this map, which will be out properly in about six weeks time, showing the responsibility for climate breakdown in the top, as you can see, predominantly red, mostly responsible in the global north, and then predominantly feeling the burden and the health and health harms and trauma in the global south. Okay, so solutions. It's no surprise that a colonial problem will have colonial solutions thrown at it. And my colleague, uh, Rhiannon Osborne and I, state that without locating the diagnosis at the structural level, tunnel vision, which is what I'll show you in a moment, tunnel vision takes us down dangerous alley alleyways. And some of these dangerous routes are the overpopulation myth, the net zero myth, and green extractivism. And what these are, are distractions. And as Toni Morrison said, one of the very serious functions of racism is to distract. It distracts and it keeps us from doing the work that we need to be doing. It makes us explain the reason for what we're doing, uh, the reason for why we're doing things. So the overpopulation myth suggests that there are too many people in this world and insufficient resources. And it relies on the um, on the myth of artificial scarcity, that there isn't enough to go around. And as we saw earlier, resources are being hoarded and kept and accumulated in the global north or in imperial cores and centers of wealth. Therefore, the overpopulation myth often places the blame on people of reproductive age in the global south to reproduce or develop more slowly. And this, as you can see, is entrenched with racism. In terms of net zero, there are lots of solutions like um, carbon capture and storage and geoengineering um, that actually don't, we don't have, um, we don't know for certain, A, that they're ready to be used. Um, and also that they're the ones that are being, that those are the solutions that are being heavily promoted. And rather than actually restructuring our economic and political systems to something that prioritizes health and well being over profit, net zero is a tool that is used by corporations to continue business as usual and forget about community health or, at worst, continue to harm community health. And in terms of green extractivism, just switching to fossil fuels from renewables may still continue to extract and not let us achieve racial or health justice. So for example, if you're trying to get lithium out of a river in a, in a community in a, where, where there's a river that is providing um, wealth for an indigenous community, that lithium is extracted for a car battery that is for green energy, that is still not getting to the bottom of extractivism and the system that is causing sickness so the system of sickness is not dealt with. Even things like Green New Deals that are global North centric may not be enough. I, I recommend that you read the recently proposed manifesto for an eco-social energy transition from peoples of the South. And this really centers energy democracy and global justice and tells us how transformative Green New Deals we need to be and why people in the global south are actually skeptical about Green New Deals. And as I mentioned before, tunnel vision. So what this is, is the fact that 
without understanding that the climate crisis is a symptom of sick systems and actually an opportunity for health justice, it's easy to see emissions as the only way forward. And it's a shame really because sustainability has been stolen from us as something that is just about emissions when actually we need to reclaim sustainability as social justice and the fact that it includes all of these factors in order for us to have an ecologically fair future. In terms of abolition, so I've been exploring abolitionist public health with a group of people and we're trying to build a movement for abolitionist public health in the UK. Um, absolutely leaning on colleagues in the US who have um, who've done who've done this work already. Um, but abolitionists like Angela Davis, Ruth Wilson Gilmore and Mariam Carver have taught me that transformation is possible. And we know that because slavery was abolished. Abolition urges us to expand our mind and reclaim our imagination. And it does this by first allowing us to get to the root of the problem. And abolition, um, for example, it, uh, the way it allows us to get to the root of it is because abolition is about removing the conditions under which prisons and policing became solutions to our problems. And if we apply this to climate change and health, it means addressing structural factors like colonialism, militarism, and capitalism. Abolition is also so um, exciting because it allows you to fight current structures and try to save lives uh, in the name of health right now because it's causing so much harm, but also it teaches you to build something new and communal and caring at the same time. And as Ruth Wilson Gilmore states, abolition is presence. It's not absence. It's about building life-affirming institutions. So I think abolitionist discourse and principles can be a huge opportunity for the climate justice movement so that we can join hands with people who want to abolish current systems because they're not serving us and they're not serving those who are most minoritized. A note about reparations and healing. And we know in terms of reparative justice, it can take many different forms. It can be handing unconditional cash, cash transfers to support health systems building in, to face climate change. It can also be global climate financing in line with responsibility for climate change, divestment away from extractive industries, canceling debt, land back, and even things like ending occupations are considered reparative justice. And it's up to the communities that are owed reparations to determine what this reparative justice looks like. I'm coming to the end now, Noel, sorry, I've run over, but just the final two minutes is about health um, organizations that are doing some of this work, breaking free from tunnel vision. So the first is MEDAC's Health for a Green New Deal campaign, which is a campaign, a grassroots campaign, that is mobilizing health workers towards a transformative Green New Deal. So what we do is participate in climate clinics where health workers have conversations with the public in a consultation type format, and we tell them and educate them and have a conversation about the Green New Deal. And generally it's very well received. The second campaign is something called Stop Cambo. And Cambo was an oil field. I say was because there was some success. It was an oil field that was threatened to be opened off this coast of Scotland. Um, but this campaign successfully undertook mass mobilization and confronted politicians directly. And we targeted oil companies to successfully stop Cambo. So we stopped, we delayed it at the start and now it's, it's stopped. Um, and essentially this campaign is continuing to stop um, expansion of oil and gas in the UK. There's many, many other organizations like the People's Health Movement that I can talk about, but um, the, the, our work at Envisioning Environmental Equity, it's, as I said before, we try to center the voices of most affected people in areas in three different settings. In Brazil, we partner with Quilombola and indigenous communities. In Uganda, we work with rural communities who've been internally displaced. And in Philippines, we work with the urban poor farmers and fisher folk. And 
we do creative and discursive workshops with grassroots and young people um, in most affected communities and we increase awareness about health, racism and climate change, as well as colonialism's impact on the climate related health inequalities that they're facing. And we have produced comics and um, we've had stakeholder circles, learning circles. Um, we've also been to COP27 and tried to present some of this work. We've got podcasts and webinars. And most recently, we've actually developed an educator's guide on climate and health justice, which we're very, very happy to share with you um, as well, if you're interested. And our future work is quite exciting. We're hoping to bring in another grassroots group from Sri Lanka, uh, where I'm from. Um, and there'll be some uh, other creative processes like a fashion show, a game, um, some more films and animations on health and climate justice. The final plug is something called the People's Health Tribunal. So I'm part of a group of organizers that are putting together um, a tribunal, which is the people of Africa versus Shell and Total Energy. So this work is being done. Um, mostly by Global North organizers in solidarity with um, the people of Africa. Um, and essentially we're putting Shell and Total Energies on trial and communities are going to come and give testimony about how their health is being impacted by these extractive industries, how they're resisting and how we can bring international solidarity and take action. We're going to have a verdict, we have judges and jurors and the action is going to take place predominantly um, targeting things like the Africa Energy Summit, um, Shell and Total's annual general meetings and things like that. And finally, I want to end with a beautiful principle of Sumat Kausé, translated in Spanish to Buen Vivir and translated then to English to life in wellness. And Zapatistas and indigenous communities work and live in this way and this Buen vivir is an ideal of a harmonious relationship between all living beings that ensures life, health, diversity, and equity in distribution of everything that we have. Thank you so much for listening. And here are some resources. I've got some references at the end, but I'll leave this so that you can contact me um, and ask me any questions. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Abby, for a really inspiring and thought-provoking thought talk, which um, spoke to the ways in which climate change, racism, and health are intertwined, and how um, systematic inequalities are contributing to a pub public health crisis. So we're going to give you an honorary geography award because you're so <laughs> honorary. Um, so lovely. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, and if anyone's got questions, please pop them into the Q&A at the bottom and I'll try and get through them. So um, I really like this call for a shift towards a more kind of equitable and community-led approach to public health and one that um, prioritizes care over punishment and to address the root causes of health inequalities. And your your work and your recent publications and, and uh, activism advocates for uh, abolitionist public health approaches, which seeks to address these systematic inequalities, um, whether it's poor health outcomes, poverty, racism, sexism, and other forms of opp oppression. But maybe if we could tease out a little bit more, um, you know, what does an abolitionist public health system look like to you? And how can an abolitionist public health approach address intersections of climate change, race and justice and, and public health? Thank you so much, Noel. Um, so in the UK context, and I imagine this is probably similar in, in most Western con contexts when it comes to public health. Mostly, we still work with the police and healthcare workers still work with the police. For example, if someone is in a mental health crisis, it's normal to call the police when actually what normally would happen is that person would be criminalized and that person would probably not receive the care that they need. And I think it's actually 
unbelievable that we still do that. Um, and the public health um, structures and institutions still normalize something that is so harmful to health. And the evidence is so clear that policing is a threat to public health. Um, and what abolitionist public health does is, I think public health should inherently be abolitionist because what abolitionist discourse tells us is that we must divest and defund and move money away from something that's harming us to create and prevent criminalized behavior happening in the first place. And one of the central tenets of, pub of public health is prevention, not cure. Um, prevention is better than cure is what is, uh, I think an old indigenous saying and people in Africa say a lot as well. So I think pu public health should inherently be abolitionist if you're trying to tackle the wider determinants of health. And there's so many parallels, I think, between climate justice and abolition, um, because you're trying in climate justice, ideally, you're trying to tackle the root cause of what how climate change has come to be instead of putting a band-aid on things. And I think that's what abolition teaches us as well. What does abolitionist public health look like? In the short term, it looks like health workers not engaging with the police and us denormalizing police and carceral logics within healthcare, but also doctor, I, I gave you the example of doctors being border controllers. That is a manifestation of carcerality in our health system. That needs to go. What does it look like? So while we're getting rid of the stuff that is bad, we also need to create the things that are good. And what community health looks like is, there's so many examples of what community health might look like. So in abolitionist public health, for example, it's about trying to get people to not end up in, in situations where the police might be called. So for example, doing more community clinics, um, ensuring that there's enough mental health support in clinics. It's, it's not something radical, it's something that is basic and will ultimately prevent illness in the first place. Um, so it's nothing, it, it's merely reallocating public funds to primary and secondary prevention. Hmm. Yeah, and there's, there's a movement um, towards this happening in the US as well. Absolutely. Of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, it's, exactly. It's um, yeah, so so maybe kind of related to this, you, you talked a little bit about the, the tunnel vision and how mm. climate change and health refers to this narrow focus on emissions and the impacts of the climate crisis, rather than a more holistic assessment of the economic structure and systems of oppression. And you mentioned some of the organizations in the UK that are have this broader lens approach. Could you share a little bit more about these organizations or perhaps some campaigns that you really liked that have this kind of um, broader sense of the intersectionality of the climate crisis and of the, the public health crisis? Yeah, absolutely. There's too many to say, um, but one that is global is actually the People's Health Movement, which I feel like people might have heard of. So the People's Health Movement is a global collective of health workers that are, um, you know, that are, it's based on the People's Charter for Health. Um, and there they have an ecosystems and health circle that essentially is all about solidarity between the global north and global south. And what they do is challenge the extractive industries that harm health. And they do that through building coalitions between different groups. Um, so that's a really good example of a health, a grassroots health movement that is doing this work. Um, I already talked about the People's Health Tribunal. Um, there's also, you know, there's a group in the UK called Climate Reparations UK, and they are a collective of different groups um, both climate groups, health groups, workers' rights groups, migrant rights groups, all coming together because climate change is and requires intersectional action, um, coming together to, um, to challenge um, and give, to challenge current power structures and give more decision-making powers to frontline communities um, that are experiencing health injustice. So that's another group we can, hurt, can learn from. 
I think also there's a lot to learn from abolitionist groups too, um, who are practicing this kind of community health and community care. Um, a lot of, you know, the other thing is, um, so, so that's another one, but another thing I'd like to say is the Western conception or the mainstream climate change movement or the mainstream sustainability movement often will forget indigenous um, knowledges. And it, it, the same is for indigenous health as well. Um, a lot of these solutions are there already and they've been telling us for centuries and living and practicing that, breathing that day in, day out. So um, I'd also go to some, um, some people who are really uh, centering that. In I'd also like to touch on research. So there's a group called the Centric Lab, um, which is a research lab in the UK that are really prioritizing environmental data justice. And I talked to you a little bit more, I talked to you before, sorry, about whose data is visible and whose data is made invisible. And what they do is with their geospatial data, try and map what they call biological inequity. So what they do is they look at um, communities that are already stressed chronically because of poor income, um, working class status, um, you know, uh, ethnic minority women. And they look at how, when you add an environmental stressor to it, how is that multiplying inequity? So some of that work is incredible. And I think um, there's so much to learn from some of those groups. But I'd also signpost people to um, mine and Rhiannon Osborne's paper, where we actually have a table of about 15 different groups that are doing this work um, that's breaking free from our very narrow field of vision. Yeah, that, that was a, a really great um, paper and something I'd be using in my classes um, from, yes. from here on. Um, so I think we've got a, a, a group of folks from the nursing, nursing school tuning in as well. So mm -hmm. and, and social work. So what role can healthcare professionals play in promoting environmental justice? And how can they advocate for policies that prioritize public health and community well-being? Thank you for that question. So I think also it's important for us to reorientate what we mean by um, working on climate change and work on sustainability, because care work, which is what our nursing colleagues are doing and what healthcare workers are doing, is low carbon. It, it, it's trying to facilitate and nourish life. Um, so it's important for us to feel and val feel value and feel um, pride for our health workers and especially people who are doing care work because care work is low carbon work. That's something that we have to um, have to remember. And also linking it back to racism, um, it's mostly women. Um, women of color, uh, probably single women um, and single mothers who are doing care work, predominantly in the UK. So it's multi-ethnic working class women um, who, are do who are underpaid and doing care work as well. So it's really important if we, if we realign our thinking to, to say, okay, care work is low carbon work and important for a sustainable transition in the most expansive way, then surely we need to invest more in that in, in health and care. What can people do um, more generally is solidarity driven work. So often when I speak to my friends and colleagues who, so for example, with the tribunal, we've partnered with a group called the Stop East African Crude Oil Pipeline. And Omar, who is leading that campaign has, when, when I've asked him, okay, what do you want health professionals to do? Often what he says is, I want you to stand hand in hand with me when I'm taking these people to court. And when I say these people, it's mostly oil and gas industries, but it can be any, in any extractive power. I want health people to stand hand in hand with me. And, it, and actually, we have that. Um, unfortunately, we have, there is a hierarchy um, within, um, within our working society and people who are health workers um, are, have, carry that extra weight. Um, so it's really important that we lean into that privilege and utilize that um, and, and essentially do solidarity-driven work. 
Um, and that could be things like litigation and doing more things like tribunals or actually just showing up um, and doing a bit of that connecting work as well. So doing workers' rights work, doing migrant rights work, um, and not just seeing it as, okay, I care about climate change, so I'm going to try and make my health system more green. It's, I care about climate justice. I see that this is also a gender justice issue. Therefore, I'm going to also support my um, LGBT siblings in their fight as well. I think that that kind of reorientation isn't there in the mainstream health space yet. Yeah. And yeah, and, and it's, it's great to hear about the the movement for a Green New Deal in the UK as well. Um, and particularly with... Um, Very small. Yeah. <laughs> That's coming. Yeah. Um, and and I, I guess with the, whenever the next election will be in the UK, hopefully the, the Green New Deal will be a, a central um, part of that. But maybe just could you share just a, a few more thoughts on, on what the group organizing around healthcare workers or Green New Deal are working and, and why that is an important kind of pillar of, of future Green New Deal policies and actions? Yeah, totally. So I think it kind of relates to the wider determinants of health. So what uh, just for people who aren't familiar with that language, um, Sir Michael Marmot, um, I suppose, coined um, help, uh, the, the social determinants of health. Sorry, I was like, what is it? Economic or social, political? All of them. So the social determinants of health is essentially a, a theory, um, well, fact, that um, your health is determined by the social, environmental, and political factors around you. And therefore, if you are, if you want to have generate better health um, or healing in your community, then something like the Global Green New Deal or local or regional Green New Deals that address different policies across the whole system, that can all determine how healthy you are. So for example, within Green New Deals, you often have um, transport related policy or you have um, something related to land justice. So for example, the public health case for a Green New Deal, which I recommend um, people read, there's a resource there on the MedAct website. It combines all of these areas and tells us why each of those social factors is also working on each of those social factors will be a win for collective health. Um, and that's why I think health workers are mobilizing towards it because most wins for climate are also can also be wins for health, um, often known as the health, the co-benefits. Um, for example, the most um, straightforward example is active um, living. So cycling is, will get cars off the streets, but also um, is better for mental health and physical health as well. So I think there's a lot of connections um, that can be made. And at the political level, people tend to like it when you communicate that a win for climate is also a win for health. Yeah. Okay, Abby, we're just right on time. Um, that, that was really a, a fantastic discussion and I, I think highly relevant for you know a lot of the students tuning in from the geography department and the nursing school and, and uh, other departments and our, our broader community here at Salem State. So I'd like to uh, thank you for your time um, and uh, look forward to catching up soon and thanks to everyone at Salem State and hope everyone has an enjoyable Earth Days. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you, thanks so much.